Hello, my name is Angela Davis and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members have access to exciting opportunities through their involvement with the Institute. This includes volunteering for evening programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to turn off your cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Gerges, Deputy Director of DMH. All right, well, I'm very happy to be here. My job is to introduce uh, Cameron, but I am gonna take just a few moments to do a little shameless plugging uh, for the Department of Military History. Um, one, it's our last day of classes, and so all our grades have to be in, so Cameron's probably feeling very, very good um, for himself today. Uh, and second, the Department of Military History just um, joined uh, the 21st century. We now have a web page. So if you are interested in finding out about our faculty, for example, um, and, uh, and also where our presentation's gonna go on uh, in the future. Uh, Cameron's one of our newer uh, faculty members, uh, joining us uh, two years ago now. Uh, he's a historian of the Second World War in France. Uh, he received his PhD in history from, the Mississippi, uh, from Mississippi State University, and he studies uh, the occupation of France, uh, and particularly French daily life uh, occupation requisitions and civil military relations in Vichy, France, so uh, Operation Dragoon is one of his areas of, uh, of, of passion study. Um, he's got a manuscript under contract with the University of Kansas entitled Occupied Requisitions, Meaning, and Citizenship in France During World War II. Uh, and you may have also seen him. He's a frequent podcast. He's been on the television show World War II uh, Battles in Color. He's also published in the New York Times and War on the Rocks and many other podcasts. So no further ado, Cameron. Uh, so good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the Dole Institute and, and everyone associated with it for giving me the opportunity to speak about a topic that I've been studying for a very long time, actually over a decade, in some form or fashion, and one day I will publish a magnum opus. All right, this will be my, the chief crowning uh, contribution to the historical field through my work. Uh, but if we take a look here at, at Operation Anvil, we'll see that there's an anvil, a swastika, and a hammer, and that hammer's beating down mighty hard on that swastika. And, and this comes from the 3rd Infantry Division's official uh, order and plans for Operation Anvil der Dragoon, which was the Allied invasion of southern France in August 1944. And I, I just love the imagery of this because it really does represent what the operation was supposed to be. It was supposed to occur simultaneously with Operation Overlord, the Allied invasion through Normandy. And, and if you think about it right, this, the scale of, of that original conception, a simultaneous amphibious landing on opposite sides of a country, really represents a very bold kind of attempt to liberate France from Nazi Germany. And, and today I'll be talking about kind of the plans, the invasion, and generally the course of the invasion, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that anyone has at the end. In a six-hour conversation with Dwight Eisenhower at 10 Downing Street on August 9, 1944, at the climax of the conversation, or debate, or conference, or however you want to frame it, Winston Churchill told Eisenhower that he would be willing to lay down the mantle of my high office. And you might think that he was talking about some far-flung political objective or some post-war settlement or about how Bernard Montgomery has once again, you know, gotten under Eisenhower's skin and Eisenhower has threatened to retaliate in some way. 
After the conversation, Church, or, excuse me, Eisenhower waited a day, and he then wrote back to the Prime Minister saying, to say that I was disturbed by our conference does not nearly express the depth of my distress over your interpretation of recent events in the Mediterranean. And this huge conflagration between the two of them was over Operation Anvil Dragoon. And in many ways, the debate over this operation represents the nadir of Anglo-American relations in the Second World War. So, the basics. It comprised two allied armies, the 7th Army led by General Alexander Patch, uh, and the first, originally called French Army B, but later the first French Army under General Jean de Lattre de Tassigny. It occurred on 15 August 1944, and it was, as uh, the screen shows, designed to help liberate southern France, capture the port cities of Marseille and Toulon, to provide another avenue of access by which the Allies could import supplies. As some or many of you may know, supplies and getting supplies to the front were critical issues that uh, General Eisenhower faced as the Allies were racing across France throughout 1944. And eventually, these two armies would connect with Eisenhower's advance across northern France and create one continuous line of allied soldiers that stretch from the North Sea all the way to the Franco-Swiss border. So, how did Anvil come to fruition? How did it come to be? Well, initially, it was floated as kind of one of many possible ideas in kind of the spring of 1943. At that time, the Allies were finishing up their campaign in North Africa, and were looking to the Mediterranean for various other avenues of advance. One could be going to Sicily, you could go into the Balkans, or the Aegean, or you could hit Italy, or you could hit Sardinia and Corsica, or possibly could hit southern France. Now, at the Trident Conference, where this first came up in May 1943, an idea of an invasion of Southern France didn't progress beyond kind of just spitballing, throwing things at a wall and seeing what sticks. In August 1943, however, at the Quadrant Conference, the idea for Anvil as a supplementing invasion to the Normandy invasion really came to the fore. And this is when it was christened uh, Operation Anvil. In November and December 1943, the Allies met with Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin for the first time in Tehran. It's crazy, right? We think of Tehran today, right, as, as an American adversary. And yet, in 1943, the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of, of Great Britain are, are flying there to, to engage in a conference with Stalin. I always think it's a really interesting kind of just moment when we contrast 1943 with 2023. At the Sex and Eureka conferences, Allied planning underwent a kind of, not a revolution, but a kind of evolution. How were the Allies going to put Nazi Germany under the most pressure possible? Stalin was pushing for an Allied invasion of France, and the combined chiefs of staff, the kind of joint planning committee of Great Britain and the United States, uh, put forward that by May 1, 1944, the Allies would land in northwest France. And Stalin and the Soviets would undertake an offensive in, on the Eastern Front to augment this. And prior to this conference, there was some jostling back and forth between the Americans and the British about where should additional forces in the Mediterranean be deployed. By this time, the Allies were bogged down in Italy, undergoing a grinding offensive up the Italian peninsula. 
The Americans, chiefly led by President Roosevelt and General Eisenhower, advocated for an invasion of southern France under the codename Anvil. The British, on the other hand, who had a substantial amount of combat fighting power in Italy, rejected this idea. They wanted to keep their options open. They wanted to keep allied options open. Maybe, right, we could land, go up the Adriatic and, and land in the Balkans and help supplement the partisan fight that was underway against Nazi occupation. Stalin intervened decisively in favor of the Americans, saying that going into the Balkans is a strategic dead end and that to fully use all these forces, you have to commit them at the decisive point, the decisive point being France. And at the conclusion of the conference, the combined chiefs of staff released this statement, and it's this one you see here, that Overlord and Anvil are the supreme operations of 1944. They must be carried out during May 1944. Nothing must be undertaken in any other part of the world which hazards the success of these two operations. Right? This is the official Allied planning statement and declaration at the conclusion of this first you know, kind of joint conference with Stalin that Stalin explicitly supported. And this came to govern and dominate kind of Allied plans and planning for the remainder of 1944. And yet, almost as soon as this agreement came, problems emerged. As I previously mentioned, the Allies were kind of stalemated in Italy, and they're trying to figure out a way, how do we, you know, break you know, this, this war of position and turn it into a war of movement? And the Allies came up with this idea. What if we tried an amphibious operation behind German lines, and we'll do it with like three weeks planning. It'll be fine. This comes to be known as Operation Shingle, and it's the Allied landings at Anzio that occur on 22 January 1944. Very soon, the Allies are bogged down as Germans rush reinforcements to the beachhead, and it begins to take up a lot of Allied supplies and a lot of Allied landing craft. Being that Operations Overlord and Anvil were these chief operations, and that, given that they're going to be very large in nature, that means you have to plan ahead. You have to set supplies ahead, right? You have to create schedules and timetables to release men and materiel. You have to build these things up so that you give your operation the greatest chance of success. And amphibious operations being the most complex military operations one can undergo, you really gotta make sure you've got nail on the head. And, sorry to get so technical, but there are these types of ships called landing ship tanks. And essentially what they allow uh, an army to do is to offload men, material, vehicles, and tanks directly onto a beachhead, directly onto land without needing a port. There was a worldwide shortage in 1943 and 1944, and they were temporarily the ones assigned to Anvil were temporarily taken from Anvil to support this invasion in Italy at Anzio. Well, given that the beachhead was surrounded and they were cut off from other allied lines, the only way to supply the beachhead was from the sea. And over the course of January, February, March, April, and into May of 1944, the beachhead was still just that, a beachhead that had to be supplied from sea. And this severely disrupted Anvil's timetable. The British, never enthusiastic about the operation, were very quick to seize on this and advocate reasons why Anvil should be canceled completely and entirely, and that the resources set aside for Anvil should be devoted to other operations. The Americans and Eisenhower specifically, very much still wanted this operation. He very much saw this as integral to the success of the Allied efforts in France. 
However, by March, late March, April, in, into April 1944, it was clear that due to the landing craft shortage, due to the soldiers earmarked for Anvil still fighting in Italy, that the operation was getting squeezed. Overlord itself required more supplies and more men than originally envisioned. And so, by the end of March and into April, the Allies formally decided to cancel Operation Anvil. And we, we see kind of a, a couple quotes here that, that kind of really emphasize and highlight the degree of, of tension and, and disagreement that occurred among the Allies. For instance, Viscount Lord Allenbrook, chief of the British Imperial General Staff, says that the Americans are being damned fools by going forward with Anvil, but rather than disrupt the unity of the Allied effort, the British will be damned fools along with the Americans. And General Eisenhower, writing to Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall, frequently laments the kinds of issues that he's having to grapple with with regards to Anvil, fighting for this operation that now he doesn't believe will be going forward. By June 1944, some of you may know this date, June 6th, the Allies land in Normandy and the great liberation of France begins. Around the same time, on June 5th actually, the Allies managed to capture Rome, right, the first Axis capital to fall. The beachhead, due to an offensive that the Allies began in May 1944, breaks German lines and allows the main Allied line to, to meet with this beachhead at Anzio, and now those landing craft that had been taken out of uh, circulation to only support the beachhead were now free and available. Allied planners recognize that there's now enough seaport, there are enough ships available to support another amphibious operation somewhere either in the Mediterranean or somewhere in Europe. And immediately, the Americans say, well, you know that one operation that we kind of had in the pipeline that we told Stalin we would do, that we've been planning for for months, Operation Anvil, why don't we just like dust off those plans and you know, resurrect it? And because planning had been advanced, right, it had been in the works for months prior to its cancellation, there were supplies available. It comes back onto the Allied docket. Now, it will be happening over, excuse me, it'll be happening after the Overlord landings. So the original conception that Anvil would be supporting amphibious operation to Overlord, we now see the reverse happening. German forces in southern France are being taken out of southern France to sent to Normandy, thereby weakening German defenses in southern France, making a possible invasion all the more likely to succeed for the Allies. There are a few main players in terms of the Allied command. We have, at the time, Supreme, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of the Mediterranean, and later he will become the Sixth Army Group Commander, General Jake Devers. The Allied Army that will initially be landing in southern France will be the Seventh Army, and it will be commanded by General Alexander Patch, who had previously seen service in Guadalcanal earlier in the war. So he's one of uh, the generals who sees combat in both uh, theaters of the war. And the first French army will be commanded by General Jean de Latour de Tassigny. Supplementing Allied forces will be the Free French Forces of the Interior. All right, these are French resistance who provide the Allies with valuable information, disrupt German forces as they move about, and generally harass and attempt to disrupt what's happening. And, the, and they will become a critical player as the Allies land and advance up the Rhone Valley. Contesting them are the evil, evil Nazis. 
Army Group G, commanded by uh, Field Marshal Johan Blaskowitz, uh, is, is responsible for defending southern France. Uh, the 19th Army will be led under uh, Blaskowitz by General Frederick Weisse. And the most powerful unit within 19th Army is the 11th Panzer Division, uh, commanded by General Van von Weitersheim. Now, as I previously mentioned, forces in southern France had been depleted in order to contain the Allied advance in Normandy. And many uh, of these divisions, 13 in fact, are all under strength, short of supplies, uh, unable to really m maneuver freely during the day because of superior Allied air cover. Right? They would interdict and attack German convoys as they travel. And they're being harassed by French resistance members. Blaskowitz doesn't have, by August 1944, as the invasion nears, Blaskowitz has very little confidence that he'll be able to successfully hold southern France. At the beachhead, where the Allies will be landing, are usually, you know, you want top-rate uh, soldiers who can contest, right, and function uh, well. This wasn't the case for Army Group G. They had what's called Ost Legion, and these were forced conscripts and they were mainly from Poland, Czechoslovakia, and the Soviet Union, impressed into service into the Wehrmacht. And they weren't well-trained, and they didn't necessarily have you know, a lot of motivation to fight for the Germans. And so what we will see happen is that they're quick to surrender because they're being impressed into a fight they never wanted to be a part of. For the invasion itself, we have three main beaches, and we have the 3rd, the 36th, and the 45th infantry divisions that will be landing. This is all under 6th uh, Corps, under General Lucien Truscott, and they fall under Patch, who falls under Devers. Um, unlike other army groups or a lot of other armies in uh, Europe, there's one corps under one army, under one army group for the Americans. Um, and it's because Anvil was seen as a supporting effort and therefore wasn't given nearly as much uh, combat strength as perhaps other units were, like, for instance, General Bradley's army group. The Germans, for their part, Again, a lot of Ost Legion uh, that will be contesting, and they're uh, called static because they're, they could only shoot in place, essentially. They didn't have enough unit cohesion necessarily to go back and forth, to maneuver, to, to you know, outflank or, or produce any serious threat. And on 15 August 1944, the invasion begins. Winston Churchill, the vehement you know, opponent of Anvil, is actually on board a British ship on D-Day. He says, you know, I didn't get my way, but now that this is going ahead, I'm going to you know, support it with everything I have. And you know, he is pleasantly surprised when the landings go quite smoothly. The Allies land about 95,000 troops on 15 August at the cost of 394 casualties. A far cry from, say, Omaha Beach or the landings at Salerno or Anzio. Part of the reason why these casualties were so light is due to the experienced nature of these three divisions. They all had previous amphibious landing experience, whether it be in Italy, or I mean, it was in Italy, either whether it be at Salerno or at, or at Anzio. They had experienced soldiers, experienced commanders, who had been working together for a long time, too. And coordination between the Navy, the British Navy, and American forces was exceptional. In addition to the soldiers landing, we have one 
kind of the equivalent of a brigade size uh, parachute element, the first airborne task force, which, is, which was to land by Le Mouille, uh and designed to capture local objectives um, and, and tie down German forces while the Allies advanced. The objective for 15 August, by 17 August, was for Allied forces to reach what they call the Blue Line, this kind of line seen up there, and then to begin you know, movement northward and westward. To the west, they would hopefully liberate Marseille and Toulon, two very important port cities that were vital for Allied supplies. Their, cap their capture would fall to the first French army. And Allied planners estimated it would take about D plus 40, so 40 days after the initial invasion, for Allied forces to capture Marseille, and about 20 days to capture Toulon. Well, given that German forces were so under strength, given that they had difficulty maneuvering, and given that the experienced nature of the Allies in terms of what they had done before, were very quickly able to surround Marseille and Toulon. And they're captured on 27 and 28 August, respectively, weeks in advance of when they were supposed to fall, with the ports vitally largely intact. Due to this rapid progress, the Allies, especially Truscott and Patch, see an opportunity to advance quickly and deeply into the Rome Valley and cut off the Germans, who by 17 August had been ordered by Hitler to withdraw from the Rhone Valley and up northward toward the German border. Happening at the same time Operation Dragoon's happening is the Allied breakout from Normandy, right? Operation Cobra as it well, that began on 25 July. By you know, the second week of August, we have you know, the famous uh, Falaise Pocket, where Allied forces are attempting to surround and capture large portions of the German army in northern France. And due to that, the rapid Allied advance, if German forces didn't extricate themselves from southern France, they risk being cut off from retreat, all German forces in, in southern and southwest France. And so in order to save those, Hitler orders the, 19th, the German 19th Army to withdraw up the Rhone Valley. And of course, uh, Truscott and, and Patch wanna, wanna prevent that. So what they do is, uh, Truscott orders the creation of um, about a brigade equivalent sized element called Task Force Butler. And it was um, some battalions taken from various regiments uh, and also armored components from six, Ar or from six Corps. And they were to advance rapidly up the Rhone Valley and interdict the major road along the Rhone Valley. There's a National Highway 7 that essentially goes north-south and is one of the vital arteries of this region. And if the Allies could cut off that road and prevent uh, the Germans from retreating, they could bag tens of thousands of German soldiers, delivering a crippling blow to the German effort. And so by 19 and 20 August, we see Task Force Butler up in this area of uh, southern France, in kind of near Grenoble, Valence, and Montélimar in the Drome. In addition, the commander of the 36th Infantry Division, John Dalquist, is, is advancing northward uh, just behind Task Force Butler. And he receives orders to interdict the retreating Germans north of the town of Montélimar, whereby they would you know, cut off the road, hold their position, and prevent German attempts to retreat northward. And by 21 August, Allied forces do emerge near the town of Montelimar. Task Force Butler makes an initial advance, and we have here 
along National Route 7, a series of hills that run very close to the Rhone River. And the road kind of sits between the river and these hills. And it's extremely narrow, and it, it serves as a bottleneck. So if the Allies, if, the American, if American forces can capture and hold these hills right next to the river, the Germans are going to have a very difficult time moving their armor, their trucks, and their infantry past it. And right, as other Allied elements move up, hopefully right, stuck, across, stuck against the river, right, we could trap and destroy German forces. However, the Allies didn't actually plan for this rapid success. So as ships are loaded with supplies, they're initially loaded with lots of ammunition designed for you know, sharp firefights and support. So there's less fuel available than might otherwise be, than there might otherwise be. And so even by August 20th, we're seeing complaints from commanders, American commanders saying, uh, yeah, it's great that you want me to go as fast as I can, but we're running out of gas. We're short on fuel. We can only make limited advances. And so behind the scenes, General Patch is, is scrambling to get emergency truck shipments of fuel up to the front lines uh, to, to enable you know, quicker advances. The Germans are quite surprised when all of a sudden, showing up on hills above them, American artillery begins to rain down on National Route 7. And General Weisse, the ninth German 19th Army commander, very quickly summons all available reinforcements to the area. And this begins what we know as the Battle of Montelimar. The 11th Panzer Division, the best trained, best equipped unit that the German 19th Army had to offer, was called from reserve and ordered to push the Americans back. And over the course of the next several days, they attempt the 11th Panther Division attempts to make an end run around uh, Task Force Butler and elements of the 45th Infantry Division, which had also been advancing northward. It kind of seesaws back and forth. And the Battle of Montelimar is a quite confusing affair, not just because of, of the various positions that both sides will take up over the course of, of this eight or nine day battle, but that it's really a hodgepodge of Axis and Allied units that get thrown together and sent toward local objectives. For instance, Task Force Butler is uh, tasked with interdicting the German retreat at La Cucourde. And so you have you know, a platoon or two platoons or a company that will get onto the road and hold it and attempt to block entire battalions of German soldiers attempting to retreat. And the Germans, for their part, right, are also attempting to seize high ground, right, to, to interdict Allied advance. And we have these seesaw battles that happen back and forth over the course of, of the battle. Gradually, though, right, the German offensive isn't to win a decisive battlefield victory. It's to maintain this critical road, to keep it open so that elements of the 19th Army can escape northward to fight another day. Whereas the Americans are very much attempting to surround and, and destroy the German army. And so it represents this you know, a, a kind of fascinating look at how operations can play out, right? How you don't necessarily have the same objective as your adversary. For the Germans, it's survival. For the Allies, it's annihilation. We have the 3rd Infantry Division making its way up directly from the south. It begins to add pressure on the Germans as, as they continue to retreat. They're in constant engagement with uh, rear guard elements of the 19th Army. And it, you know, we can see here by 26, 27 August, as more and more reinforcements show up, that you know, at various points, the Allies are attempting to, to cut off access to, to the road. Eventually, by the 29th and 30th August, the Allies are able to trap around 6,000 German soldiers uh, at, at, in, in, near Montelimar. Uh, in Montelimar itself, they have a plaque that's dedicated to the 3rd Infantry Division, thanking them for liberation, liberating the city. 3rd ID doesn't show up to the very end of the battle, uh, but 
they are actually the ones who liberate this city because most of the action of the Battle of Montelimar happens north of the city. From there, as 11th Panzer and the 19th Army continue to retreat, the Allies and American forces continue their pursuit, eventually with the goal of uniting with uh, other Allied forces that are making their way going from west to east toward the Franco-German border. And on September 11th, 1944, uh, elements of George Patton's 3rd Army make contact with 7th Army, thereby creating this continuous front that we see uh, from the North Sea to the Franco-Swiss border. The battle in its aftermath uh, are uh, quite horrific, not only for the soldiers involved, but also importantly for the civilians. Right? It's always important to remember that these places on maps, the land that armies traverse, are places where people live, sometimes for generations or for hundreds of years, and that they too are participants in the battle, unwilling participants, but participants nonetheless. And we see after, you know, and we see this happening, you know, time and again across all of Europe and across all of France as it's being liberated, that homes get destroyed and damaged, people die, and there's also a lot of just stuff that exists from battle, right? Burned out trucks and tanks, um, lots of horses that, that, that perish also, and it's particularly bad on National Route 7 because as the Germans are attempting to retreat, they're getting you know, bombarded by Allied artillery, by Allied planes. And so the Germans lose over 2,000 vehicles uh, throughout the course of the battle. And, and that, that wreckage is strewn across this narrow corridor. And so it, the civilians behind now have to undergo months and months of clearing operations to restore the places where they live and call home. We often forget about the, our sites of battle as the campaign moves forward, right? Units have objectives they have to meet, and so they continue the advance. But in the wake of that advance is frequently human tragedy. Operation Dragoon was a tremendously successful Allied operation, and in many ways, the most successful Allied amphibious operation of the Second World War. The advance far exceeded expectation. Casualties were, comparatively speaking, negligible for the Allies on D-Day. Over the course of the next month, there are about 25,000 Allied casualties, but there are about 160,000 German casualties, most of whom do get captured. Army Group G retreats to the Franco-German border in disarray, but they're able to reconstitute themselves. The rapid restoration of Marseille Toulon allow for Allied supplies to start being funneled up the Rhone Valley to supply not just the 6th Army Group, but the rest of General Eisenhower's force. And by the end of the Second World War, so from say about September 1944 to May 1945, 25% of all Allied supplies that go to the front come through the ports of Marseille and Toulon, where they otherwise would have had to have been shipped over either the Normandy beaches or eventually when you know, Antwerp opens up through there. It's a ringing and shining example of successful coalition warfare. Although the debates about the operation could be quite acrimonious between the Americans and the British, the planning and the execution of the operation went really well. And it's a testament to the working relationships between you know, the captains and majors who you know, are stuck in these planning cells and really make these operations run smoothly. Operation Anvil Dragoon, and you know, right, this is my hill I'm going to die on, is one of those 
operations that gets overlooked, and unfairly so. Part of the reason is there's so much else happening simultaneously when the operation occurs. As I mentioned earlier, the fillets pocket's happening, right? And the, you know, there are countless and countless books on the fillets pocket. You know, did, was it the Canadians' fault or the Americans' fault that you know, the pocket didn't get closed? What was Montgomery doing? Patton, you know, you know, running free across France. All right, these are all the typical tales that you know, we're all closely and intimately familiar with with regards to what's happening in the summer of 1944. We don't hear a lot about the Seventh Army or General Patrick, General Devers. Some of us might know Audie Murphy, right? America's most decorated soldier in the Second World War. He was a participant in Operation Dragoon. And I'll leave and finish my presentation with this, that you can't understand Operation Overlord, you can't understand Allied plans of 1944 without first understanding that Operation Anvil was a critical missing component of that initial operation. General Eisenhower is frequently uh, characterized as someone who wanted a slow, broad front advance through France. And yet, the Allies agree in December 1943 that they're going to undertake simultaneous amphibious operations on opposite sides of a country. That's about as ambitious as you can get. And, and, and so, the story of France's liberation is incomplete without incorporating Operation Anvil Dragoon. Uh, and so I encourage everyone to please read more about it all the time, forever. And when my book comes out in about five years, read that too. <laughs> For future reading uh, over the operation, here are some uh, uh, some works you could consult. My favorite work on, on kind of Operation Anvil Dragoon is still the U.S. Army's official history and the kind of the first 200 pages of that, uh, Riviera to the Rhine. As a testament to how, you know, historically speaking, Anvil Dragoon is forgotten, there are about, what, 87 volumes in the U.S. Army's Green Book series. The volume that talks about the 6th Army Group was the very last one published in 1993. We also have, uh, from the German perspective, uh, Joachim Ludwig's Rückzug, uh, intimate detail about German planning, about the defense of, of France. Uh, an excellent biography of, of General Devers. Uh, here you had Mark Stout, First to the Rhine. They talk far more about the first French army, so if you're looking for more information on that, uh, this work is uh, worth consulting. And then, you know, some guy talking about the other Supreme Allied operation of 1944 at War on the Rocks, kind of brief summation uh, I, I released for them uh, back in the day. I would also ask everyone to please show up on 6 July. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Martin Clemis, will be talking about invasion and counter-invasion, Vietnam 1976 to 1979. Uh, well, he'll be discussing kind of the Vietnamese-Cambodian uh, conflict there. With that, i um, happy to take your questions, and thank you for your time. First of all, uh, let me say I enjoyed your presentation very much. Thank you. Uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Overlord uh, operation, the landings at Normandy, uh, several commanders uh, acquired uh, reputations as, as extremely talented commanders, uh, Eisenhower, Bradley, uh, uh, Patton, etc. cetera. And uh, my question is, uh, looking at this front at uh, uh, Anvil Dragoon, uh, do you feel that there are some commanders there at, at, uh, at, uh, uh, at any level uh, who deserve this reputation as uh, talented commanders but are overlooked? Sure, yeah, thank you so much for the question. Uh, yeah, I can, three immediately spring to mind for me. Uh, and I guess I'll start at the highest level and work my way down. 
First and foremost, I'd like to mention General Jacob Devers, who was the, supreme, the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of the Mediterranean and later would become the Sixth Army Group Commander. He was intimately involved in developing U.S. Army tank doctrine in 1941, 1942. In 1943, he's sent by General Marshall to England, and he helps you know, organize the soldiers who are being sent there for training, uh, supplies and material, and helping to prepare for the overlord invasion that will eventually occur in 1944. And at the turn of the year from 1943 to 1944, essentially Devers and Eisenhower switch places. Eisenhower goes from being Supreme Allied Commander in the Mediterranean to England where he will prepare and ultimately execute Operation Overlord, where Devers essentially takes his place, becomes Deputy Supreme Allied Commander under uh, uh, Field Marshal uh, Harry Wilson. Uh, so Devers is seen as a peer and contemporary of Eisenhower, and Eisenhower in many ways sees him as a rival. And and as a, a kind of darling of General Marshall. And so there's definitely some kind of professional friction between the two of them. The other, the next person I'll, I'll mention is, is General Sandy Patch. Uh, he commanded the Americal Division in Guadalcanal uh, throughout that campaign and it's you know, sent to the Mediterranean Theater to command 7th Army for for, for Dragoon, and you know, he's very much also able to, along with Devers, uh, you know, plan and kind of create the conditions where when Anvil was resurrected in June 1944, it was done so without much delay. Uh, throughout the course of this debate around whether or not the operation would happen, both Devers and Patch actively worked to siphon resources and to uh, guard resources they had earmarked for Anvil to make sure they didn't get sent elsewhere because otherwise the operation would have been much more difficult to execute. And lastly, I'll mention uh, the Sixth Corps commander, Lucian Truscott. He's uh, seen as a hard-charging commander. He uh, won lots of plaudits for his work in Italy. And as Sixth Corps commander, it was very, um, very active in in pushing American forces forward to the north in an attempt to cut off German forces. And he's actually promoted to Lieutenant General in September 1944 uh, as a result of his exploits over time. And so those are three commanders I would, I would say definitely deserve credit for being very capable uh, commanders in, in this operation's execution. Uh, was this the operation that uh, Senator Dole was injured? No, uh, Senator Dole is injured in Italy, um, and so, yeah, not in uh, Anvil Dragon. Uh, Don Connolly, could you uh, amplify a little more on the French Army, mm -hmm. and particularly uh, what they're composed of when yeah. they land, and then mm -hmm. how they try to reinforce uh, reinforce themselves as they move up into France. Yeah, sure. Great question. Thanks so much for asking it. Uh, so the first French army is primarily composed of French colonial soldiers. So you see this really interesting dichotomy emerge where f soldiers of France fighting to liberate France are f these people are. F fighting to liberate their colonizers so they can continue to be colonized. It, it, it in many ways boggles the mind. The, the first French army is also primarily supplied by the United States Army, so the first French army looks, you know, in superficial appearance a lot like uh, American forces because they're primarily supplied by Americans. Um, and as the first French army, you know, you know, captures Marseille and Toulon in, in record time. Their, their fighting record up the Rhone Valley is, is exceptional. Um, and as uh, the line kind of settles down and we enter kind of stalemate in the fall of 1944, the first French army and, and kind of French policy under uh, the free French leader Charles de Gaulle, uh, they enter what's called the Blanchiment, literally translating to the whitening. And so what was happening is that they would withdraw combat units of French colonial soldiers off the front line 
and then put in their place former French resistance fighters who had been, you know, been organized and drafted into this new free French army and, and be trained and being replaced to fight in combat uh, positions. And the colonial soldiers would be relegated to garrison duty somewhere far in the rear. Uh, and, and so another reason why I, I think Anvil Dragoon might not get the recognition that it deserves is you know, a non-English speaking allied force is helping you know, a lot with the invasion and concurrently with that, not just regular French soldiers, but French colonial soldiers at that. Um, and, and so, you know, it can, it can prove a daunting task, right, to try and understand and incorporate that, especially, especially if you don't speak French, for instance. But thanks so much for the question. Have time for about one more question. Uh, Gary Bjorgi, um, I don't know if this is the best last question or not, but anyway, um, you mentioned the uh, efforts uh, to uh, supply the uh, unit that was sent up to mm -hmm. try to cut the road, uh, and you talked about the trucks. Mm -hmm. um, in the breakout from uh, Normandy, you have a, a tremendous effort uh, logistically to, through this gigantic uh, truck system right. of uh, supplying the uh, troops at the front. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's become a very important part of uh, Army logistics history. Mm -hmm. How about the, uh, what is the place in Army logistics history of this effort to, uh, you know, supply units advancing rapidly with trucks in uh, operation uh, Anvil. Sure, yeah, thanks so much for the question. So yeah, you're referring to the Red Ball Express, the kind of ad hoc system that, that Eisenhower develops, uh, or that the Allies develop to, to supply forces at the front. Uh, so what's interesting about kind of this effort to, to supply the invasion forces is that Devers and Patch and Truscott are all aware that they're running against the clock because the more time that they waste and delay, the more German units are going to be able to escape the trap they're trying to set and live to fight another day. The problem is, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't expect the landings to be as successful as they were. They're days ahead of schedule by the end of the first day. And, and so, because they weren't anticipating this rapid exploitation of the situation, are having to scramble to find kind of fuel that's you know in the back of ships because they're supposed to come out much much later, and so there isn't actually all that much. There aren't all that many kind of trucks available to even get fuel to where to where it's needed. There are actually only emergency runs, right, kind of cobbled together from trucks that are unloaded and then loaded for fuel and sent. Uh, to Task Force Butler, such as the urgency of the situation. So there's no real kind of systematic deployment of, of logistics resources in a way that are able to supplement allied, allied forces. It's, it's very much a, a case of, you know, the situation merits this, this kind of ad hoc response. Um, and, you know, because the, the operation goes so much quicker that it's, it's much more a case in kind of emergency management in terms of supplies than, than kind of this model for how do you, you know, develop a system of logistics when you don't necessarily have the capacity to, to handle all of it. Uh, and, and with that, I'd love to thank everyone for coming out again. I really enjoyed uh, speaking with all of you. <laughs>